Okay. Okay, so um, for the test, you have 60 questions. Now, not much are calculations. Uh, I can't remember there. I may have slipped a few in there, but pretty much it's just uh, multiple choice and some true false. Um, and it goes back and uh, details uh, absorption and cooling towers primarily, and maybe a few other questions out of the videos. And also there's questions out of this Marley, this big Marley document. That's why I pulled this thing up. So um, this thing's a hundred something pages. I don't need you to read all of it, certainly. We mentioned this before, but I would say, what is section one? Let's, I, I would read through uh, section one. And of course, you know, it's open book. So um, it would be harder if you couldn't reference things. But uh, I think it's about the first 30, is it 33? Nah, this is not this far. I think it's 33 or something. I think this is section two. Oh, this thing keeps jumping on me. Now, section one. Um, here, let's go up to the index. So, I think about the first uh, 33 pages, this section one, I think we'll do it. Let me pull down again. Make sure I'm not lying to you. I don't try to lie to you, but I'm not going to say I don't do it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. If you read through, like, say, uh, probably 28, we'll get any questions, I think, that I ask. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of information in here, but um, to be safe, you might want to look through 33. And a lot of it's pictures and that, so it's not that bad a reading, you know, there's not that many words on a page. But I would at least scan over that and then, uh, because there are a number of questions that are taken out of this. I do remember that, okay? So uh, you can start the test at 9.30. <laughs> it's 9.30 on Thursday. <laughs> Maybe I'll get my times and dates straightened out. Uh, and you've got, uh, 80 minutes to do it. I think there's a one minute grace period. So you actually get 81 minutes from whenever you start. So that's the story on that. Okay, so let's continue on. Uh, let's see, so these are the document. These are the lecture notes, or actually this is just the book, but this is what I would have written lecture notes on the board, but I can't really do that in this format. So uh, we're just, you know, you have this and it's probably better really. I mean, I'll, I'll talk through this slowly. You can hear it, you can take a few notes and then you can come back and actually read what the author has to say. This is a very excellent chapter. One of the best uh, that I've ever run into. It's one reason I like this book. Uh, the other uh, file I'm pulling out of is this that I sent you, the title of this one is what? Lecture Notes, Chapter Three, Packet One, but it's really misnamed a little bit. But uh, anyway, it starts out with a site chart and it's got the thermo temperature table for all the different temperatures. And then we've got uh, pictures or diagrams from the text and then we get some example problems down here that uh, we will talk through as we go through this. Because this guy did a really good job of laying this stuff out, I must say. I've always, once I found this, I've, I've used it <clears throat> for a long time. Okay, so let's get rolling. Okay, so I think, I think we covered a little bit of this last time, but it doesn't hurt to review a little bit. So. Um, and one of the keys to understanding psychometrics is getting used to working with partial pressures. And so, you know, we start out, and the fundamental here is Dalton's law, which just says, if I've got a container, you know, think about a, a tank or a big rectangular 
chamber on the table that has three different gases in it, um, that the total pressure is the, is the pressure exerted by constituent one, that partial pressure plus the partial pressure that's exerted by two plus the partial pressure that's exerted by three. And if there's four, five, six, seven, as long as we're working under ideal gas, I mean, then the assumption is these molecules don't really interact with each other other than elastic collisions. And you got elastic collisions off the walls and all. And it's those collisions that cause the pressure. So the more oxygen molecules collide with the wall, the more pressure is generated by oxygen. And so the partial pressure of oxygen would be higher. And the same goes for water vapor or nitrogen or whatever else is in the container. Okay, and then, so we write this then more specifically for moist air. And so we say, well, in moist air, we got a bunch of nitrogen, we know that. So we're gonna have some partial pressure from nitrogen. Uh, we got a bunch of oxygen. Uh, we got <laughs> an ever increasing, I guess, amount of CO2 even though it's still someplace around, I don't know, 350 or 375 or parts per million. And if you start thinking about an increase of 50 parts per million, that's, that's not a lot of increase, you know, but anyway, I don't want to get political here, so I'll uh, stop this. And then uh, we've got argon. Uh, which is again a trace gas, or even less than there is CO2. And then we got our old buddy water vapor over here at the end. So hopefully we put everything that, you know, is significant enough to really contribute to the overall pressure uh, in the list here. And then to simplify that we're doing problems, we really don't want to account for nitrogen, oxygen, CO2, and argon separately. So those get uh, bundled together under the partial pressure of dry air. So the little sub A is for dry air and the V is for water vapor. And we have to separate out the water vapor because as we go across coils or humidify or something, we change, you know, in a given flow rate of conditioning air, we, we, we may well change the amount of water vapor, but we don't typically change the amount of dry air. You know, if you got a flow going into a place, you don't condense out any of the dry air components when you go across a cooling coil. I hope we're not getting that cold. So anyway, that's, that's why this is done. Uh, and then we worked through this exercise before. Um, well, okay, this, uh, this is a really important sentence here. Um, and so you should note this. I think it is implicit in what we've said, but it's still pretty important. Each constituent in a mixture of perfect gases or ideal gases behaves as if the others were not present. Okay, and so there's a bunch of ramifications for that, which means we can write the ideal gas law for the whole mixture, or we can write it for each constituent. We can write it for the dry air, we can write it for the water vapor, you could write it for the nitrogen, you could write it for the oxygen. And so, you know, it's PV is equal to MRT, but the question is, if you're writing it for water vapor, then you would just put the partial pressure of the water vapor, and the M would be the mass of water vapor. Uh, the volume would probably be the total volume of the container. R would be the gas constant divided by the molecular weight of water vapor, and then T would be absolute temperature. But so you can use that equation for different purposes, depending on what it is that you're asked to calculate. Okay, and so then he uh, uh, makes an example here of saturated water at 80 degrees, okay? And that leads me up to, whoops, no, I'm in the wrong file. Uh, I got too many files here, so let's go to this one. Okay, and we'll look on the site chart here in a minute. Uh, but at 80 degrees, I think we did this the other day, but I wanna make sure everybody's good. So this is just saturation pressure, right? This is absolute saturation pressure. This is just steam tables, just like the back of your thermal book. Okay, well, and so if you get down to 80, we see we're 0 0.507 and in the example, in the text, he just cut it off there, but it 0.50736 in the detailed ASHRAE table. And so 
if you're saturated, if your relative humidity is 100%, then that is your water vapor pressure. End of story. Okay, so it's not hard. Now, let me ask you a question. What if the relative humidity was 50%? What would your partial pressure be? Well, you know, the easiest thing you could hope for to be correct would be that it would be half, right? If your relative humidity is 50%, your partial pressure is half of that of saturation. Well, that turns out to be right. So if you're given, if, if, this, if this little exercise was restated instead of saturated at 80, it was 50% relative humidity at 80, we would just come in for our partial pressure of water vapor and we would take this 0.50736 and divide by two. And that would be our partial pressure. If it was given at 75%, we would take 75% of this. So finding if you're given a temperature and relative humidity and uh, also a pressure, we're assuming that, you know, for the psychometric is basically atmospheric, one atmosphere, you know, 14.7 roughly PSI, then, you know, it's all good. Okay, the other thing, if we have standard pressures and we have a site chart, we can go up here to the site chart and we'll, we'll start referencing this back and forth a little bit. Let's see, where's 80? Okay, so on the site chart, uh, the bottom axis is dry bulb temperature. It goes from 32 to 120 on the standard site chart. And the only dry air is on that axis because as we come vertically, we're add more and more moisture to the air because this axis is pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air, okay? Um, another measure is sometimes you see on these are grains of moisture per pound of dry air. And the magic conversion is 7,000. That's something if you don't know, you probably should write down and remember there are 7,000 grains in a pound. Where that comes from, I don't know, probably goes back to biblical days, who knows? Uh, that's one I've never looked up. Um, okay, so at 80, oh, I lost my, there we go. Okay, 80 is right down here. Of course, that little thing keeps jumping up it's in the way. And then as we add moisture, we go vertically and we stay at 80. And you see these are lines of crossing relative humidity. There's 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. Well, we got to get all the way up here because this is saturation, right? At this point, okay? And this, that's the 100% relative humidity line, which is saturation. And then I can read over here, on the axis, what is that, 0.0? Uh, each one of these little lines is uh, what, 0 0.0002, okay? And so I could read that as 0 0.0222, roughly, because that's like I'm one little line above the dark line. And so that would be pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air, okay? Uh, if I was at 50%, then I'd be back here at this 50% line right here and I'd read across, you know, and I'd be roughly half of that. But, or, so, so anyway, okay, so let's see. Let's, all right, un, unrotate here. There we go. So we'll, Go back to the other file now. Okay. And so, you know, then he applies the ideal gas law. Uh, he looked up the specific volume in the table, which was uh, 632.67. One over that is density. And so out of the table, you would get this number 00158. And then when you go to the ideal gas law, you can also solve for density, which is uh, 
the partial pressure of the water vapor divided by the specific gas constant of the water vapor times the temperature in Rankine. And you see it comes out with almost the same number. And so his point in doing this is to show you that the ideal gas assumption is very, very good for uh, HVAC type calculations. Okay, enough of that. So let's go on. Uh, this is a very important, humidity ratio is an important parameter that we work with all of the time. This is that vertical axis that's on the site chart, okay? And so the definition of it is the mass of water vapor present, usually in a unit mass of air, it doesn't have to be, but in a certain, in a given mass of dry air. So the little a indicates dry air and the little v indicates water vapor. Okay, and that's just the definition. So, you know, like we saw on the side chart, the units on this are gonna be kilograms of water vapor per kilogram of dry air. Because so we're gonna measure those, those flows in terms of the dry air flow. Um, and so in US units, then it's pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, next, relative humidity. And relative humidity has uh, several different ways that you can express it. Uh, we start off with the mole fraction, okay? And uh, let's see, let's go back up to this table we talked about last time. So <clears throat> the, um, now this is the definition of dry air, okay? And it's given in terms of a volume fraction, okay? Um, for an ideal gas, the volume fraction and the mole fraction are equal. Now, if you, again, if you have intermolecular reactions like you have in high pressure gases, that's not true. But again, for us with this ideal gas assumption. So, and the way I like to think of a mole fraction is it's a particle count, okay? So, you know, let's say if, uh, let's say we had 10,000, we had this dry air and we had 10,000 molecules of dry air in a container. Well, so that would tell us we have 2,095 oxygen molecules. We have 7,809 nitrogen, et cetera. And so when we add all these up, we're gonna get 10,000, okay? So, you know, these volume fraction is a particle count fraction. So you can go to parts per million, you know, whatever you wanna do once you kind of understand what this means. Okay, so let's go back to this. So humidity ratio, the initial definition is the ratio of the mole fraction or the volume fraction uh, of the water vapor, which would be X sub V in a mixture to the uh, mole fraction X sub S of water vapor if it was saturated at the same temperature and total pressure. So if it's already saturated, then it's one, right? Which would indicate 100% relative humidity. If you have half as many moles in the dry air as it can hold, then it's gonna be what 50% relative humidity, okay? So the way I like to think about it, it's, I just think about if you tell me it's 50%, I said, okay, so this sample of moist air is holding half the water vapor that is capable of holding at its temperature and total pressure. So that's kind of the common sense definition, but you know, sometimes engineering books want to get more technical than that. And, and I mean, you need to, they got to put math to it. So that's what this means. Mole fraction of water vapor present to mole fraction of water vapor that would be present at saturation at the same temperature and total pressure, okay? Well, okay, also for these ideal or perfect gases, uh, the mole fraction is equal to the uh, partial pressure divided by the total pressure, okay? And I mean, that's easily proven for an ideal gas. <clears throat> well, so knowing that, then we can substitute in these pressure ratios. So for X of V, we put in the partial pressure of water vapor divided by total pressure of the mixture. 
And then for the saturation, we do the same thing. Well, the total, the big P's, the total P's cancel. And so we get phi is the partial pressure of water vapor divided by the, the partial pressure of water vapor at saturation, which comes straight from the steam tables at the temperature of the mixture. So that's pretty easy. Um, we can also play around and define it in terms of densities if you want to. Uh, all of these others are somewhat useful. I mean, the, the partial pressure ratio is pretty useful. Uh, they usually don't go back to mole fractions. That's just kind of definitional stuff. Um, and I guess you can do this. I, I don't have much experience where this has actually come into play, but I mean, mathematically, uh, you can uh, make this substitution and see that relative humidity is also the uh, density of the water vapor present divided by what the density would be at saturation. So they're at the same temperature, total pressure. So this works as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's move on. Now, this is extremely useful. This relationship we get here, we use all of the time. You, you did this in thermo, probably thermo two, but uh, let's go back through it. So remember the definition of W is M sub V divided by M sub A. Well, we can just take ideal gas since we're assuming that holds and we can write it for M sub V. So this is just P sub V, V is equal to MRT. And of course the mass has to be with a little V and uh, it's a specific gas constant for water vapor. And so then we just solved it for uh, M sub V. So it's the partial pressure of the water vapor divided by total volume of our container divided by specific gas constant water vapor times absolute temperature, okay? And then we can take it one step further. We can back out the molecular weight from the universal gas constant. And so this is the specific gas constant. We write universal and then that puts the molecular weight of water, the cap M sub V up here in the numerator, just substitution. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the dry air. So we'll write the uh, ideal gas law for the dry air. So we're gonna get what uh, partial pressure dry air times total volume is equal to uh, mass of dry air times specific gas constant dry air times absolute temperature. And then we solve it like this. We do this same, uh, substitution to show the universal gas constant. And so we get the molecular weight of dry air up here. And then we ratio these things to calculate W, which would be just this piece divided by this piece. And when you do some nice things happen, like we, use the, we lose the cap V, we lose cap T, and we lose universal gas constant. And we come up with this relation, <clears throat> which is what we use all of the time uh, if you're doing psychometric type calculations. This is probably, you know, probably the most, or certainly in the top two or three used relations. Well, we simplify because this is molecular weight of water vapor divided by molecular weight of dry air. Here's the numbers. And so this produces this constant 0.6219, which doesn't change because these molecular weights don't change. And so W, for moist air is 0.6219 times the partial pressure of water vapor divided by the partial pressure of the dry air. That's very useful. And don't forget that uh, partial pressure of dry air is total pressure minus P sub V because we only have two components, right? We talked about that up right here. So uh, you got P sub A in that denominator well, from this expression, that's just cap P, the total minus the partial pressure of the water vapor. And you often see this written in that form instead of that piece of A down there. So I would probably write that in my notes because that's probably the way you're gonna wind up using it. Because when you work a problem, usually you determine the partial pressure of the water vapor and you know the total pressure of the mixture. And so that's, but anyway, uh, substitution gives another relationship for phi, just combining those two equations, which uh, could be useful. 
to you. Um, okay, this other parameter mu is the degree of saturation. It's another psychometric parameter. Uh, <clears throat> and so it is the humidity ratio of your air, pounds per water vapor per pound of dry air, divided by what would that be at saturation? At 100% relative humidity, what would the W be? Okay, and so you just ratio those and we assume same temperature, total pressure while we're doing that. Um, I, I, I mean, I've, I've seen this I mean, defined many times, but I, I don't know that I've ever really used it. I'm not sure. This probably shows up in some specific type of analysis, but I, I can't recall ever using degree of saturation, but we use the W and the fee all the time. Okay, dew point. We need to uh, define what do we mean by dew point temperature? Uh, and um, there's a couple of ways to think about this. He's got a couple of definitions. Some you probably like better than others, but you know. Uh, so dew point is the temperature of saturated moist air at the same pressure and humidity ratio as the given mixture. Okay, so that, that definition always kind of left me cold. But if you think about it, this next sentence or two is pretty good. So you got a mixture of moist air. If you start cooling it at constant pressure, it's the temperature at which condensation first begins. You start seeing water, liquid water appear. Okay, so let's go back up to the side chart. That's where we really... Uh, Okay, uh, no, it doesn't really matter. Let's uh, let's just pick a state. Uh, I don't know. Well, let's say we're where's a good. Oh, that's pretty good. What, let's say we're eighty and fifty percent relative humidity. So we're right here. Okay. Well, so if we cool it at constant pressure, you know, cooling is going to the left. So we're encountering, and we're not changing moisture content, right? If you go up, you're adding moisture to your air. If you go down, you're removing moisture. So if you move left and right, you're either just heating or cooling in a sensible fashion. Now the water molecules are being cooled, but they're not condensing yet, okay? So we're at say 50%, so that's right on that line. And so we come across, we start cooling, 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 and the relative humidity is going up, right? Because we're getting closer and closer to saturation. There we just crossed what, 80%? Coming on down, we just crossed 90%, bingo. At right about 60 degrees, looks like it's maybe a little bit below 59 and some change. That's gonna be the dew point because that's the point that we hit the 100% relative humidity line. So on the side chart, it's real easy. You just put your point on here and come straight across until you hit the 100% saturation and that's your dew point. So that's pretty nice. Now, the only thing that'll get you, well, you may have to uh, do some other considerations is atmospheric, this is atmospheric pressure. So like if you're working in a compressed air system, one of my favorite problems on a test is to let you take in air at some condition, 80 and 50%, and compress it to 100 PSI G, which is 115 PSI A, and then tell me the dew point. Well, how would you do that? Well, let me tell you how you do it. Let's just, uh, let's just work through that. Uh, let's see here. We gotta go down to this guy. <laughs> I wish these things were rotated the same direction. Come on, honey, don't do it this way. There we go. Okay, so well, let's see. Let's come down here a little bit. Oh, let's say we're let's say we're ninety and a hundred percent relative humidity. Okay, so if we're ninety and a hundred percent, then that pressure 
0.69889 is going to be the uh, partial pressure of water vapor in the air. Great. Okay. So, and we'll say that uh, we'll say that we're going to bring this air in. It enters the compressor at 14 psia, absolute pressure. Okay, and we're going to boost at 100. We're going to have 100 psig which would be 114 PSIA, right? Okay, so we need the compression ratio, okay? And you can't do compression ratios in gauge pressure when one of them is zero. Because <laughs> when I divide by zero, I know pretty much, I know what my calculator is gonna say, dash, 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 or, you know, you dummy, <laughs> you can't do that. Okay, so if I take 114 divided by 14, that compression ratio is 8.143. So 8.143, I'm gonna store that in one. So that says that for an ideal gas that each component is gonna be increased by 8.143 times. Well, so what's my water vapor pressure gonna be when I come out of the compression chamber? Well, it's gonna be 8.143 times what it went in, and it went in at 0.69889. Okay, so I take that compression ratio, recall one times 0.69889, and I get 5.69. Okay, so my water vapor pressure is going to be 5.69 psia when I come out of the compression, and it'll also be hot, it'll probably be 180. Something, whatever, 175, 180, 190, 200, depends on how good the compressors operate. Well, so how am I going to find the dew point temperature knowing a pressure? Well, dew point temperature is at 100% relative humidity, right? Well, I got a table right here. So all I got to do is find 5.69 for the pressure and look and see what temperature that is. And that'll tell me the dew point. Well, that's a pretty cute trick because I can't use a site chart because that site chart is no good at 100 PSIG, you know? And eh, that's, that's the trick question that we put on the test, you know, to see, and we give you a site chart. And if you go use the site chart, then we get to mark it wrong and say minus five or something, okay? Okay, so let's go down. So what did I say? It's about five, a little less than 5.7. Well, okay, there's 5.72, there's, what's it, 5.59, something like that. So we're in between here. We're pretty darn close to 168 would be the dew point temperature, a little bit less. Well, so my compressed air dryer cools it to 100. So do you think I condense some moisture out in that dryer? Well, the dew point's 168 and I'm gonna cool it to 100. Oh, well, it's going to rain like crazy. And that's what the dryer is supposed to do is condense some moisture. Or, or actually, the after cooler, the after cooler on the compressor comes first, and then we put it into a dryer, which takes it down to like 35 to 37 to wring more moisture out of it. Okay. So anyway, let's go back. Okay, so that gives you, should give you some idea what the dew points are about. There's another statement here. Uh, at a given mixture, total pressure dew point uh, is fixed by humidity ratio uh, or by the partial pressure of water. So anyway, um, I think we've defined that. Okay, so we're gonna be working with enthalpies. And of course, all this stuff gets more complicated because we have a binary mixture, right? We have dry air and water vapor present. Okay, so how are we gonna calculate enthalpy? Well, this book, I took this out of, likes to use I for enthalpy, because we just have too many uses for H. <laughs> H is overwork, heat transfer coefficients and all kinds of different things. So in this text, I is enthalpy. So, well, you got two components and they each have some energy, right? You've got dry air, it has temperature, it has sensible energy. Um, 
and then you have water vapor and it has latent energy as well as sensible energy, okay? So we're gonna have to add those together. Okay, so the units on this overall will be like BTUs per pound mass of dry air. Everything is measured per unit of dry air. And so this IA will be the enthalpy of the dry air at the temperature of the dry air. And this will be the enthalpy of the water vapor present at that same temperature because it's in a mixture together. And so remember W is amount of water vapor per unit mass of dry air. So the W just says, well, how much of this stuff do we have? If it was totally dry, then W would be zero and this would drop off. But of course, with moist air, most of the time that's not gonna be the case. And I is just the enthalpy of the water vapor, okay? Uh, let's see. Yeah, you can read that, but this assumption I do this enthalpy is functional. Okay, so in psychometrics, what we do is we, we pick a reference state for zero. So we say that the enthalpy of dry air is zero. If you're working uh, in US units, it's zero at zero Fahrenheit, or I guess it's the same point. In, met in SI units, it's zero at zero degrees C. Now, if you look in the back of your thermal book, they have a different reference point. For their dry air, they reference it to zero at absolute zero. And so you can't pull enthalpies off a psych chart and immediately do calculations with them in an equation where you pulled enthalpies for dry air out of your thermal book because they have a different zero reference. So you have to adjust one of them, you know, <clears throat> whichever one uh, you want to is fine, but you, you have to be careful about that. Okay, so. Uh, and we're talking about the reference here, and we typically are assume that the specific heats are constant to avoid integration terms. So that makes the enthalpy of dry air, uh, I sub A, CPA, which would be the specific heat of dry air, which is typically 0.24 in the US units, times T, and really that's a delta T, but it's the temperature of your air minus zero. And so if you're subtracting zero all the time, you don't have to write it, you know, but it's, it's assumed because, you know, this kind of a calculation, H is CP delta T. And so, you know, that sometimes questions arise over that. Um, and then the uh, enthalpy of the uh, saturated vapor uh, at, this reference point is in US units, it's 1061.2 and in metric units at zero degrees C, it's 21 or 2501.3. And so then that vapor is gonna be that uh, reference enthalpy plus CP for the vapor times temperature. And again, this is basically a T minus a zero. Okay, so when all this gets put together, uh, we have two different equations, one for uh, US units and one for SI units. And so now this is handy to know because, you know, you may be asked to do some programming, could be in a thermal design course or something where you need to, uh, in a MATLAB program or something, program the enthalpy of moist air and you got nice little expression. Uh, so 0.24 is CP of the air and 0.444 is CP of the water vapor. And then these are temperatures uh, above or below zero. And so similar for SI units right here. Okay. All right, so let's look at a little example problem here. Um, so we wanna compute the enthalpy of saturated air at 60 and standard atmospheric pressure. So we could go to the psych chart and do this, but it says compute. So we're gonna go ahead and do it with the equations. Well, at 60, uh, I mean, we can go up to, so we'll check 60 and let's see. So what is it? It's saturated, yeah, I wanna make sure. 
So at 60, I go back and up here. And there's 60. And so I look up my saturation pressure. So it's 0 0.25635 on this one. And he said 0.2563. So he just truncated it one. Okay. And so uh, total pressure is it's standard atmospheric pressure. So that's 14.696 PSIA. This is PSIA. So all the pressure units are going to disappear. And so, you know, this is that molecular weight of, I'm sorry, um, partial pressure of dry air, total minus saturation. Subtract those off, do the math, and we get 0 0.01104, okay? And then the enthalpy, we simply plug in the 60. And so now we have the W that we need, and then we got the temperature. So we just plug in and we get uh, 26.41. Okay, so let's go back up to the psych chart and check those. So this was saturated at 60, 2641 and 0.011. All right, I don't have to do that. I'm just going to go back over here. Okay. 60. Oh, this one's easy. It's right on the line. Okay, well, enthalpy is right up here, right? I, did, we'd not, I, I didn't mention this uh, before, but this is your enthalpy scale. And they're kind of these diagonal lines that swoop across. So here, it shows it coming out down here. See, they come out at that same angle. So there's 25 BTUs per pound. Here's 25 BTUs per pound up here. And so that's eh, a little hard to read. There's 30. You know, what was it, 2641, something like that is what he, so 25. I think there's every, this goes 0.246.8624. And yeah, so that's, if I read that, blow it up and count lines, 26.41 uh, looks pretty darn right, okay, from reading this one. And then for the moisture, I'm reading across, and look, it's right on. 0.011. Okay, so that verifies the calculation with the psych chart. Okay, so that's pretty good. Okay, adiabatic saturation. This is a little derivation of another equation that this is probably the twin sister of the one that we already have. This one is a little takes a, is a little more involved in the derivation of it, but it's extremely useful as well. And what we find is for moist air, we, you know, we have to have an additional property to define a state, temperature, pressure, and something else. And this equation helps give us a pretty easy way to get the something else if it's not given to us. Okay, and so this is a device it's called an adiabatic uh, saturator or an adiabatic saturation device. And so the way this works is we put moisture in over here and the assumption is that it's not saturated. I mean, if it's saturated already, this thing isn't gonna do anything <laughs> because the idea is to saturate it on this side and we do it adiabatically so that we can't have any heat transfer into or out of the device everything that goes on is the evaporation of water into that airstream. And that evaporation process will cool it down while it increases the moisture content. And then we get over here and we assume that this thing is as long as it needs to be to produce saturated air or 100% relative humidity at the exit. Okay, so that's why it's called the adiabatic saturation device. Okay, so let's look at it. So we put our uh, moisture in. It has some relative humidity. It could be 20%, 30%, 40%, you know, whatever it is, at some initial temperature, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, you know, pick your favorite number. Uh, total pressure, usually fairly close to atmospheric, but 
you know. And we also assume there's no real pressure drop across this thing. It's just wide, pretty much a wide open chamber. So we don't really have to worry about pressure drop across it. And we have some amount of moisture, some uh, humidity ratio coming in, pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air. It flows through this thing. Some of this water evaporates to the point that it's saturated at two. Well, as that evaporation occurs, this uh, um, dry bulb temperature is gonna fall. The more the evaporation, the more cooling effect that we're gonna get on this thing. Uh, the amount of moisture at the exit is gonna increase. Pressure is gonna be essentially the same and the relative humidity is gonna be 100%, okay? So it's gonna come out saturated. And as some of this water evaporates, uh, we're gonna have to make it up and to keep this thing from going dry. And we're gonna assume that it comes in magically at T2, which is this adiabatic saturation temperature, this cooler temperature at the exit. Now how, this device knows what temperature T2 is. I guess it gets the thing going and it measures this and adjusts it. So I'm not saying this is a very practical device to try to build. You probably could work out some of these details, but that's the way uh, this thing operates. Okay, so we start writing equations for it. Okay, well, so we look at the, this is the energy balance. So, the energy that comes in the front end of this thing, well, I sub A is the enthalpy of the dry air at temperature one, okay? Plus, and now we have to add on the energy in the moisture that comes in with it because it's moist air. So that's the uh, humidity ratio at one for the amount times the enthalpy of the water vapor at one. So these two terms together, and this is per unit mass of air. So we're just doing this per, per one pound, or one per kilogram or per pound of air, whichever system that you like, okay? So, you know, the, so we're just putting a control volume around this thing. And so this is the energy that's entering on a unit mass basis. And so then we have a certain amount of water that we have to add in here. So this is coming in. Well, how much is that? Well, it's the amount of water per pound of dry air that exits minus the water per pound of dry air that came in. And so that difference is what got picked up as, we've, we, as this uh, unit mass of air flows through this adiabatic saturator. Okay, so and it's coming out saturated and the, the, the star indicates, this is kind of, this is the author's nomenclature. So uh, the star indicates saturation at the exit. Uh, the two indicates it's at the exit, which is saturated, which the relative humidity is 100%. So we may have, in some cases, we got maybe redundant notation, but that's what it means. Uh, so this term is over here at the exit and it's at saturation. And then of course, the uh, I sub W is just the enthalpy of the water vapor and the star indicates that it's at T2, which is the adiabatic saturation temperature. Okay. And then, so the only exit term coming out over here is the enthalpy of the dry air at temperature T2. And then the moisture is the amount of moisture, the humidity ratio at saturation uh, at, at location two, and it's times the enthalpy of the water vapor uh, at temperature two, which is at adiabatic saturation. Okay, a lot of words, but you know, if you think about it and just think about the energy terms, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and just note that M dot W is the amount of water that gets made up and it's per unit mass of dry air flowing it's just the uh, humidity ratio of saturation at two minus the humidity ratio that comes in at one. So it comes in fairly dry, leaves saturated. The difference is what evaporates from the water in the device. Okay? All right. And that gets added at T2. All right. So this goes a little more quickly now. Okay. Now, 
So thermodynamically, we typically call that, the official definition is the adiabatic saturation temperature. But it is very, very close approximation to the wet bulb temperature. We go, oh, wet bulb. Okay, dry bulb, wet bulb, okay. Now I'm starting to understand. And the wet bulb temperature again is a measure of the dryness of the air. If wet bulb and dry bulb are the same, you're at saturation. If wet bulb, if the wet bulb is far less than the dry bulb, then it's very dry. And we can decrease the temperature a lot by this evaporation process. Out in the West, they have what they call swamp coolers. A lot of houses don't have formal air conditioning because it's so dry. Even when it's hot, it might be 95, 100 degrees, uh, but you can still do effective cooling on your house by simply blowing air uh, across some sort of a wetted media that promotes evaporation. And so it's, it's hot and dry and you want it to be cool and moist. Oh man, that's a, that's a match made in heaven. So you can put moisture into your house, which keeps your lips from cracking, and you can also cool it down. And all you have to do is run a little pump, move some water around, and a fan to move some air around. A lot cheaper than running, you know, a five horsepower compressor or something to uh, power an air conditioning unit. Okay, so um, the, 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 the kind of the magic here is this assumption that this adiabatic saturation temperature basically is the same as the wet bulb. They're not 100%, but they're pretty darn close. And you know, in engineering, pretty darn close is often good enough. Yeah. Okay, so uh, steady state, steady flow. Okay, so this just restates the equation that I wrote on the previous page, a little bit neater perhaps, but it's the same equation. And then we just start doing a little bit of uh, rearranging of terms. So, you know, get all the, the W1 terms over here. You got an IV1, uh, and I guess we've got an I star W here that gets combined in, and everything else goes to the other side. And so you get this. Uh, and then we're gonna simplify a little bit. This, uh, at this temperature T2, this is saturated vapor minus saturated liquid at the same temperature. So that's just the enthalpy of vaporization. So he, he changes nomenclature from this bracket term to this I star FG2 right here. So that's that. And I think that's really the only um, change between these two. And then you simply solve for W1. So now we have another expression to calculate the humidity ratio that's coming into this thing. We know the humidity ratio going out because that's the purpose of the device is to saturate it. And so then, um, and we basically assume we kind of, the pressure just kind of go away. We assume there's no real pressure drop across this. And so whatever pressure you have coming in, you have roughly the same pressure going out. And uh, so, uh, T1, T, T1 is the dry bulb temperature in, and T star two is the uh, adiabatic saturation temperature, which is an approximation of the wet bulb temperature uh, at the inlet of the device, okay? So this is this equation. And so we'll, we'll use it in conjunction with this one uh, to solve some problems. So you, you do need to be comfortable with this. And note, this temperature difference is gonna be negative because T2, a wet bulb, at most can be equal to, so it could be zero. If the air came in saturated, that could be zero. But most of the time, the wet bulb is gonna be less than the dry bulb. So this, this first term, and CPA is just 0.24. So uh, that's gonna be a, uh, th this first term is gonna be negative. So don't let that concern you. In fact, that's something you should look for to make sure that you didn't swap the temperatures and get them in the, the wrong uh, order, okay? All right, so let's take a look. And this is, this type problem is one of my favorites. I think this is good. It exercises 
your ability to do these calculations when we get to our psychometric test, which will be after this test, the one after the one on Thursday. Okay, so the pressure entering and leaving adiabatic saturator is atmospheric, typical. The entering temperature is 80, the leaving temperature is 64. Compute the humidity ratio, um, W1, and the relative humidity, phi1. And of course, another way to say that is this air coming in, it has a dry bulb of 80 and a wet bulb of 64, which is typically what you would need because their devices, these little, uh, uh, there's all kinds of devices out there to measure a wet bulb temperature. So you can measure the wet bulb and then, and then use that for the adiabatic saturation temperature and then calculate your humidity ratio. So I guess that's really kind of where it goes. Okay, so when we look up here, first thing we do, we've got this humidity ratio saturation at temperature, at the wet bulb temperature. Okay, well, okay, so I have this expression. And so, you know, all I have to do 80 degrees, uh, well, that's on the inlet. This is, this is uh, at condition two, so this is gonna be at 64. So I have to look up that saturation pressure at um, 64 degrees. So let's go up and just do that. Make sure that everybody's good. Uh, I'll, I'll just, sometimes it's quicker just to go around the block than it is to do the other one. So we're looking for 64 here. Uh, and 64, so 0.2952, okay. Da, 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 da. Is that what he's got? 0.299. Let me see, 64. Well, we got a little discrepancy in number. Um, he takes this out of the tables in the back of the book. So there is, let me make sure that is 64, right? Yep. So 64.2952. So there's a little discrepancy in the tables, but whatever table you got, that's. That's because this is a, uh, it's a saturated condition. So you just look up the uh, partial pressure. Okay, so anyway, so you plug in here, this is your total pressure. And so we get the, uh, the saturation uh, humidity ratio at 64 degrees. We're taking at uh, 0.0129 pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air. And then we're gonna go into this equation so uh, we've got 0.24 specific heat of dry air, 64 is the wet bulb or the adiabatic saturation temperature minus the uh, dry bulb. So say that's gonna produce a negative number. And then this is um, the humidity ratio. And we also need the enthalpy of vaporization right here at 62. So let's go back. See if this number's a little better, come on across. Uh, this was 0 0.57, or I'm sorry, 10, 10.5707. Let's see if that matches what he's got. 10.5707, 10.57.1. So, so the tables agree on that one. And then we also have to get the uh, enthalpy of, uh, saturated vapor at one minus the, the, and so that's at what? That's at the 80 and the enthalpy of saturated liquid at 64. Okay, so we can go back at 80. So that vapor I'm getting 1096 and the water at 64, looks like about 32.07. So just looking those things up. I don't know if that agrees. 1096, 32, those, those look good. Um, so we calculate this <clears throat> and we get, uh, this is the humidity ratio. Oh, I'm sorry, it's up here, I skipped down. Okay, so this is the, this is the humidity ratio that comes out of the adiabatic saturation equation. 
And then if we want the relative humidity, we have to know the vapor pressure, okay? And so the trick here is to go back to this equation. Now, you know, we used it before up here for saturation. Now it's not saturation, but now we know what W1 is and we know the total pressure. So we can solve this for the partial pressure of water vapor at one. And so you just set that equal. You know, you, you gotta do a little bit of algebra, but it's not bad. And so we get 0.2142 is the partial pressure. And then we need to divide that by the partial pressure at saturation. And that'll give us the relative humidity. Okay. And it's the partial pressure at saturation at 80. So there's lots of little opportunities to make mistakes here. But so that would be the, the saturation uh, pressure at 80. And so that's the 0 .0, 0 0.507 that we've used before. So this would say <clears throat> that we're 43, 42.3% relative humidity. Okay, so we're 64 on wet bulb and 80. So let's go back to our site chart. Okay, so here's 60. And you know, these lines, a little hard, but 64, there's 65. There's 60, so we're coming down kind of like this. Here's 80. And so there's 80, we come up. so we're right in here someplace. And so what do you get? 42, 43% relative humidity. Looks correct. And if we read across, um, this is, this is 0 0.008. 0 0.009, so it's definitely less than, uh, let's see, 60, well, where, where am I? I'm getting lost in this uh, a little bit of that. Here, yeah, so it should be less than uh, 0 0.10. So let me go back and look at this answer again. Uh, yeah, 0 0.092. So I think if you plot all that stuff out on the site chart, you're gonna say, hey, that all works pretty well, okay? So that's pretty good. Okay, so we're, we're making progress here. Uh, then at this point, we review the site chart, which I think, uh, let's pull back here a little bit. I think we've, we've done a good bit of it already. Um, so like we said, you got dry bulb temperature on the, basically the x-axis on the bottom. You've got moisture content coming vertical. So anytime we move up, we're adding moisture to the airstream. Anytime we come down, we're taking moisture away from the airstream. Typ typically we do that by going across a cold, a cold coil over here on this side and condensing out some moisture. Uh, these are, uh, these kind of steep lines are lines of constant specific volume. Yeah, let's get over. So yeah, let's make it one bigger. It's hard to look at this on this computer screen, but anyway. Uh, so this is what, 15 is the number, and this is volume cubic feet uh, per pound of dry air. Okay, so that's the cubic feet per pound of dry air. And so there's there you've got 15, there's 14 and a half, there's 14, 13 and a half, you know, we just keep kind of rolling on along there. 13 and a half, 13, 12 and a half. And where this is down here at 32, where we uh, wind up, okay. Um, we did relative humidity, I think we did wet bulb. So lines of constant uh, enthalpy and wet bulb are real close in slope. Uh, let's see, so you see there's this 60, I think that's probably a line of uh, constant wet bulb, let's see. Ah. 
Yeah, so there's a line of constant 60 degree wet bulb swinging down through here. And you see the lines of constant enthalpy. They're not quite parallel, but they're awfully, awfully close. So there's a 25 BTUs per pound line sweeping across there. Um, I think that's most of the lines here. Uh, we'll just mention briefly the protractor. When we get into conditioning processes, we will use this protractor. Notice you have a sensible heat to total heat ratio scale on the inside and an enthalpy delta H divided by delta humidity ratio on the outside scale. So uh, we'll see how to use those when we get into some cycle problems here pretty quick. All right. So that gets us pretty much through the site chart. Oh, okay, that's the end of that pack. Let me go to the next pack. How are we doing time-wise? 37, oh, we got a few minutes here. Okay, so here now, you get, you get to see the old yellow notes. <laughs> some of this we've, uh, some of this we're going to skip over, wet bulb, we've already kind of talked about that. You can read over this, but this is talking about that how adiabatic saturation and wet bulb are pretty close to the same thing, but not exactly, but. This guy's psych chart, so some of this will be done. Let's see, example two, three. Let's see, have I done that? Uh, let's see. Or what two three louder do we have what not today thursday yeah no i, I sent an email so it's in ilo it's in i learn uh, okay i don't think i have two three so we will, uh, all right, so let's, okay, so let's look at, um, we're gonna go through some of these uh, classic moisture air processes and we'll apply conservation of energy and mass to them and just kind of see, and then uh, work with them on a site chart. So first of all, and the simplest, is just the heating and cooling of moist air. Uh, this is without a change in moisture, okay? And so if you look on the site chart, what you see, if you start over here at one and you wanna cool, you're gonna go over to two, and it's just coming across at the same uh, humidity ratio, W1 equals W2. If you start over here at two, or you could start over here, this could be one, and you could come the other way. So that would be a sensible heating. Okay. So uh, this, this is pretty straightforward. Um, and you can read the enthalpies, you know, just on your enthalpy scale, or you can calculate the enthalpy, either way that you want to do it. So for our steady state, steady flow, you know, if you just write kind of the first law, and this is, uh, you've got the heat transfer term uh, plus, you know, on the inlets and the exits, summation of mass times enthalpy in is equal to summation of mass times enthalpy out plus any work. And there's no work going on here. So the work term uh, disappears. 
so uh, equation simplifies to this, mass flow rate of dry air times enthalpy at one, plus the heat transfer is equal to the mass flow rate. Uh, and the, the mass flow rate is the same. I mean, this is just a single duct. So we have the same mass flow rate on both sides. So that's handy. And then just times the enthalpy at two. And we just have to remember that these uh, enthalpies are binary, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, two components to them. We have the dry air and the water vapor. So we have to, if we read them off the psych chart, it all comes out together. If you're gonna calculate them, then you'll have to go through both of these terms. So probably easier to just read them off psych chart, unless you're at some pressure that you can't. Okay, so that's what that looks like. And we went over that. Uh, so just rearranging and solving for the heat transfer rate. It's just the mass flow rate times the enthalpy difference. Um, and you can do that with mass flow rate times uh, CPA, the specific heat, I'm sorry, just CP, gotta be careful here. So mass flow rate of dry air times the specific heat times the temperature difference. But notice this specific heat is adjusted because see that water vapor is in there and it's getting heated and cooled as well. And so you can't use just 0.24. Now, usually that addition is pretty small term. It'll be like, so that adjusted C, CP will be like 0.244 or 0 0.242 or 0 0.245. You know, it's not a huge adjustment, but it's incorrect to not include it, you know, because you're saying you're ignoring the sensible energy that either goes into the water vapor or comes out of the water vapor. So, to do this, then um, you have to, uh, if you're gonna use the CP delta T, then you have to gussy up the CP for the CP of a dry air. So this one is 0.24, humidity ratio times 0.444, and then you add that together and plug it in here. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's pretty good. I'll dig up this, uh, we've got some examples and we'll, We'll move on. We've probably got about uh, maybe three, three or four more lectures in psychometrics. And then at the end of psychometrics, I'll get a, I'll get a homework out to you pretty soon. Uh, we wanna get past this test before we worry about any homework. Um, don't forget to read those, like that first chapter, say the first 30, 33 pages of the Cooling Towers Fundamentals. That's that big Marley document and uh, uh, good luck on the test, and uh, uh, if you have any uh, big issues with it, send me an email, and I will try to respond. Thanks. Everybody have a great day.